Today, uh, we're exploring uh, the brown ibis and uh, osprey, maybe. Looks like osprey. Um, I'm joined, as always, by my feathered friends, Allison, who is on the internet, Chris, also on the internet. To find them, hit up binaryjazz.us or find us on Twitter at binaryjazz. And there's links to all the things you want. A link is a typically text that you can click on sometimes a picture, and it will take you somewhere. Hopefully we'll take you somewhere today on this podcast. Let's go on a journey. <laughs> I'm going with the birds. <laughs> well, I was waffling about topics. Now I definitely know which topic I'm bringing to the table. Ooh, I hope it's waffles. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That'd be amazing if I could somehow... Oh, never mind. I don't even know how I begin to organize like a waffle delivery to each of you like timed perfectly with the start of the podcast. Yeah, it sounds like uh, Uber's not the way to go since they don't think humans are a core part of their business and fired 8% of their development yeah. department. Me too. Yeah, maybe, maybe now's a good time to sell stock in Uber if you have stock in Uber. Well, I should have said that since this is not a uh, stock show. What's the deal? Do you need to go out? I'm gonna check you out. <laughs> While you're doing that, I'm gonna see if I own stock in Uber. <laughs> if I do, it's like a point of yeah. percent. Check yeah. the old stock portfolio. Yeah. Well, I'm just gonna jump in and yeah, let you know that the topic this week is Clarence Birdseye. Clarence, Clarence Birdseye. Yeah. This is a medical medical condition, actually. Even though it sounds like human, it's a medical condition where you get Clarence bird's eye um, that cause a second eyelid to grow. Oh. Ew. <laughs> what? I don't know why I find that so, like, ugh. <laughs> it does sound like an episode of X-Files a little bit, now that I say it. Yeah. Someone blinks and then they, like, blink while they've already blinked. Mid-blink, they blink again. Like the... That's not a bird's eye, though. That's, a, that's like a... Is it more reptile? I don't know what yeah. that is. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's fish, right? Oh, maybe. When fish need two sets of eyelids. That's Clarence fish eye. <laughs> yeah. It's a totally different episode. No, I do not own stock in, in, in Uber. There you go. Sweet. It's like, yeah, that's good. I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it I mean, who knows? <laughs> Where do you fall on the scheme of things? Maybe, maybe, in, maybe as they're in free fall, like, Jeff Bezos will buy him or something, and then suddenly their stock will be worth a lot. I, I mean, you know, everything is in free fall at the moment, so. I have a lot to talk about in my next one-on-one -on -one meeting with Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put a good word in for me, would you? Or maybe not. No. A lot to tackle. Uh, Clarence <laughs> Bird's Eye. Being, uh, Clarence Bird's Eye is uh, a Native I'm American. Enough, Jeff. <laughs> Clarence Bird's Eye is a Native American. Uh, who uh, is famous for stopping <laughs> two sets of eyelids. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not a bird. The, the bird doesn't do that. Clarence Birdseye is a Native American who historically is known for stopping the surge of white people in, into North Dakota. Oh, no, but you're right. Clarence Birdseye is a routing technology that is named for Clarence Birdseye. I just like the phrasing, no, but you're right. <laughs> it's an edge router. It's a device you put on the network that prevents the surge of... White supremacists? <laughs> yeah, Google um, and Twitter could probably benefit greatly. Uh... YouTube, I meant, not Google. When have I Google. ever brought a technology term to the table? Have I yet? Right. Today. 
today. Today would be the first. Yeah, that's like, oh, it's, it's just a rude so throwing I'm you off the track. Clarence Bird's Eye. Um, you're familiar with Bird's Eye Vegetables, right? That's who they're named for. Clarence Bird's Eye. <laughs> What, what, are bird, that, sorry, what are bird's eye vegetables? I think it's, it's a brand. It's, yeah, it's a brand. So he he was the, uh, so I'm, I'm barking up the wrong tree when you're like, what are bird's eye vegetables? It's not this thing. No, maybe, he, I'm, um, maybe I'm just that great. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, <laughs> I did, I did he, improv uh, in high school. I can. <laughs> he's like the Henry Ford of vegetable automation. <laughs> <laughs> He invented the... I love that, especially if he came before Henry Ford, and yet somehow <laughs> still, you're still known for like someone who came after you. I think that's the second time I've used the phrase vegetable automation. I think a couple weeks ago we had this conversation, and that's how we ended up in like uh, um, back alley rocket science, right? <laughs> vegetable <laughs> automation. I don't, even, I don't even know. So we have the big machines, and they cut the vegetables, and they soak them in water, and they pour I them was down the more chute. like after they're in from the field, like the Into from the, the big, yeah, the packaging portion and distribution. Okay, yeah. So yeah, he was like Sam Walton, but but not, how do so so since you're an expert on <laughs> vegetable automation, uh, yes. Gary, uh -huh. how do uh, well respected expert? <laughs> how do oh I have the shirt. How do outstanding in my field. How do uh, vegetable automation uh, facilities perfectly chop each uh, individual like green bean or like uh, husk and cut off the the kernels of corn for their can? Let's just start with the green bean first, right? Okay. Do you recall when you got a box of colored pencils and you would put them in there and they would all like line up? Mm -hmm. So effectively what happens is you cue them up that way and the machine is um, loosely based on the movements of um, Benihana chefs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that that's exactly how they modeled it, too. They were like, oh, there are these chefs. Look at, look at the wrist movement specifically. We need that kind of play in the nut mounted blades here. Yeah. Um, and so you asked about husking? Yeah, and, 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 and the corn kerneling. Kernelization. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Kernelization. Not to be confused with caramelization. It's a totally I, different thing. The, uh, the husking uh, actually happens before the corn comes in. That's in the field. So that's not part of the automation thing. It comes in husk or not husk. So you need to have it's human beings to take care no. of it. No. Uh, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a field machine. I know nothing about that. That's not nothing to do I see. Stuff. I see. But it comes in and the corn is cobbed still, but not protected by a husk. So, like, you know, like the iris of a. Uh, a um, camera. Mm -hmm. So there's a machine, the pedal driven, that you feed it in and you set the pedal down and it clamps down and you push it through, it's vibrating and it corn kernels flying everywhere, buckets and you catch them and off you go. Fabulous. That sounds believable, right? Thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, I have no idea. I do think that. Um, uh, I do think it's pretty amazing that people have like made machines like I can drive through the field and get off of these plants like the things that I want to eat and just leave everything else I don't know like in a wake of death like behind me or whatever but, but still <laughs> yeah yeah but still I mean it's pretty amazing that they like where we're we gonna drive through that field of corn stalks what is it? corn pipes corn cob pipes and um and this machine's gonna like rattle and stuff and you're gonna get like a, a big you know, trailer full of corn. So why was, why, we're, we're in the, we're a society, we're um, currently in a moment where we're panicking about uh, robotic automation and rightly mm -hmm. so, uh, as we eliminate so many jobs. Um, are there parallel, I mean, cer certainly there are parallels to like agriculture automation. Are there like lessons that no, this is a dumb question. Nobody in power learned any lessons ever. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody learns things. Don't be silly. <laughs> we had so uh, let me take you on a tangent. So I, it's been a week. Um, so Tuesday, someone posted at work that they got a coffee in an edible cup, like edible cup, edible cup. Yeah, 
fantastic, right? She said, it was good. Kind of tastes like a waffle cone. And then someone said, I saw a package of those the other day, edible cup, edible coffee cup, but it was made somewhere in Eastern Europe. So I thought like, great. So I've reduced the waste from a paper cup, hmm. but now I've like put that into shipping this stuff from Eastern Europe, which turned into a conversation about like, like it's, it's cheaper to ship a container of goods on a boat from China halfway around the world to the U.S. than it is to ship it across the U.S. If it lands in L.A., it would cost me, um, if it lands in L.A., it would cost less to get it from China to L.A. than from L.A. to Jacksonville, right, when I was doing the shipping thing or the international, like selling shit on the internet thing. Um, and, and that is a, uh, a function of, like, labor imbalance, right, that, that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like, it, it costs fuel, but really the expensive part is the people, right? So if we automate ships, like, great, we've taken out, like, the inexpensive labor of shipping. But, I mean, the big crush is going to be uh, on the expensive goods is going to be when they can be delivered within the U.S. By, from my bubble, right? Like, that labor is taken out, which is terrible. But that's the expense of labor is, is, the, is the interstate shipping. And that's something that's being looked into, too, with, with uh, driverless cars. They're, they want yeah. to have Yeah, oh, I know. I, and it, well, ugh. Trucks. Where and where do you where do they go? Where do these where do these what do you what do you do with these with these folks that are the thing? So things that that the way and, and you can see a fucking it, cup of coffee cup. You, you can see it too. You can see, because that's why there's all this push towards uh like people who are formerly in manufacturing jobs or mining jobs or whatever. Oh, you should learn a new skill. You should learn computer programming because where where like the jobs that cannot be replaced the jobs that require a human being to be sitting somewhere and doing a thing like using their brain like the jobs that can't be replaced are not things that you can do with your hands but things you can do with your brain because things you can do with your hands can for the most part jeez your cat he's also upset about this coffee cup situation <laughs> uh, <laughs> This binary jazz is a fourth member, and the fourth member is displeased. <laughs> Not happy. <laughs> um, what was I even saying? Uh, so the thing that can't be automated—the thing that can't be automated—is is people like the human being thinking and using their brain. <laughs> so yes, I see you. I see you. Yeah. I still uh, don't really believe he emanates that noise. But... You and should that's, just squeeze in the right way, and just like. And that's why, and that's why, like, there's all this push into to tech jobs. But like, the thing is that people who were formerly using their hands, former miners, don't. I mean, that's not an easy transition from from learning how to manipulate like a mining thing, or let's into let's talk into about another industry though. Right? So like, we we could absolutely uh, when you look at like building housing, right? Like, it takes a skill set to. I was just thinking about housing. I was like, I, I have a, I have a, uh, well, I don't want to say a friend. He's my sister-in-law's boyfriend, but I don't really want to say a friend. Um, I have a, an acquaintance uh, who is a contractor. And so I was just thinking, as I was talking about these things where, where we can be replaced, um, I was, I was thinking like, what happens when his job is taken? Like, how does that even work? Like, mm -hmm. I, there's enough that I think that he does, and by like by proxy, skilled handymen and construction workers, and well, maybe not construction workers on huge towering things, but like you know, individuals doing like smaller type jobs where I think it's like artisanal enough still that you need yeah. a human being. But on a large scale, like if you're building a skyscraper, I can imagine like that being automated somehow. Well, but that industry is is so so piled up. In the sense that, like, we, wow, we don't we have a no shortage. rating today. Do we? You said fouled up. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, think of the housing situation. There's no shortage of housing. We don't, why do we need to be building new houses, right? You don't need a guy to hang drywall in new houses because you don't need new houses. We have plenty. But there's something else driving that industry. So There's a housing, housing shortage in Salt Lake. I mean, there's tons of empty houses everywhere. Maybe not in Salt Lake, but. There's tons of empty houses. Yeah, I mean, if you move far enough, houses, yes, but there need to be jobs where the empty houses are too. 
well, they're certainly not going to be driving jobs. <laughs> right. And there, there wouldn't be drywall jobs either. So, I mean, like. But at the end of the day, like, oh, I think there's something to be valued about human connection where it's just like, remember how excited you were about like your sod guy? Like. I was excited about my sod guy. I still have <laughs> dead grass. It's not been laid yet. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's maybe this isn't the best example then. But like you were, <laughs> <laughs> you were thrilled by the idea of someone who is excited about sod. Would you have been as excited if you were like, I hired this company and a robot's gonna come and lay down sod? Oh like, uh, yeah. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, I, I know that's why a I'm robot out there like me. Yeah. Like but but I think the answer is like yes. And then the aftertaste would have been like, damn, how many humans used to do that job? right? Like when he does this, there's going to be a crew of him and three other guys that show up and boom, 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 and knock it out, right? It's like so, I think it. some, some things were much more comfortable with being automated and some things you still just want to, I was going to use the phrase call someone. I don't want to call anybody, <laughs> but you want to contact someone that's real <laughs> mm. for them to do it. But like, but not in a skyscraper sense, but like, like if some, I was Clarence having like, a, pardon? Like Clarence Birdseye. Like the, the, that. you want to give him a call and be like, I want a bespoke house. What is that? The inherent, cost? the inherent capitalist mandate that says that company's job is to deliver shareholder value means that like a company that wants to provide that human interaction needs to figure out ways that they can automate it to cut costs. Like they're, they're completely at odds, right? Like you can't efficiently sell human interaction. You can't efficiently sell human. You can't efficiently sell this, right? But don't you think it depends on how much you value the human interaction at? Like if people that's actually. If that's, spend. if that's what you're selling or if that's, that's the selling point of your product, then. Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that most majority of businesses actually work, work like that, but if they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I, I, certainly there are businesses that are, that are the exception, right? Like businesses are not inherently uh, evil. But many businesses that oh, there's tons are publicly of traded. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, the vast majority of them are. I would I would agree. The vast majority of them are. But but there there are there are dozens that aren't. Maybe even hundreds. There are some. I mean, a percentage. But the point is, like the the mandate as a business is to deliver shareholder value. The employees are are rarely shareholders, so their 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 demands or expectations are never congruent with what the business is doing. So you know? is the is a potential solution to have the shareholders shift where their values lie, and therefore, if they have to meet different values, then it would have to live up to a different expectation. Um. Yeah, but 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 it's not it's not like the retail shareholder. Like Chris's expectations as a as a shareholder in Uber don't matter to Uber one bit. It's the it's the huge like package deal that own you know. 80, 90% of their stock. I mean, Chris as a shareholder is inconsequential to Uber. Well, Sorry, and he's Chris, a zero like share shareholder, so even less. <laughs> even less consequential. <laughs> even less so. They care about him even less. This is an interesting, uh, an interesting um, uh, train of thought. I would add a further interesting side note to this. So I, 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 I talked a lot about, on Slack about soccer the other day. Uh, so we're gonna go down. We're gonna go down. <laughs> we're gonna go down the soccer rabbit hole a little bit. In, in all seriousness, I did appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I mentioned is that um, soccer is not a business in which com in which ownership groups make money. Most ownership groups, at least internationally, look at owning a soccer club for like the prestige that it brings them personally or as like a labor of love, or like they just own and accept the losses that they take from the soccer club, no matter how successful the soccer club is, uh, they, they own those losses and they accept them and it's okay. A few instances historically have occurred where that is not the case. Um, I think that that's something that the US market is, is trying in, like within the US is, is trying to avoid because it's really hard to convince American business people and American like rich folks in general to just part with their money and just say goodbye to it forever. Like that's not a thing that, that like conceptually works in our brains, especially when we have other competing sports that make shit tons of money. Um, 
but there are a few instances in other places where where the model is totally turned on its head. And one of those uh, that's probably most interesting conversationally is FC Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona uh, is actually owned by the fans. Like it's legitimately owned by the fans. The fans own the team. They like season ticket holder member, like they, they have a, a fan organized like council that, I mean, like, I don't, I don't understand like the structure, like how that, how that is represented in like the, the team, like infrastructure, the bureaucracy, but like it's owned by the fans. And, and so obviously like, like they need to, they put out a good product on the field so that they make money so that the fans go to the game. So the fans continue. I mean, you know, and Barcelona is one of the best teams in the world and has one of the, you know, most renowned players in the world uh in in Lionel Messi so like obviously they're doing something right I don't know where that goes with like how much money they make or lose um I don't know the details exactly but I do know that's an that's a thing where like like in that case the shareholders are the they're the consumers as opposed to the shareholders being just this bunch of uh of rich dudes that have tons of money and don't care about the people that use their product well the difference so is, is you've distance yeah you've you've spread the share like like now the situation where if you were an uber shareholder right like they don't care what one guy has to say they care what you know the majority hold i don't know who right owns but i would assume some company will owns big amounts of stock um the uh but in their in their situation there is not that one big person that they 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 have to deliver shareholder value to they're not answering to a single individual they're answering to the, the, to the masses and, yeah yeah and, and, and if the and masses are pissed, mass decisions, yeah, and if the masses are, are pissed, different. Like the masses want that coach out, then that coach needs to get the boot because they're not happy. Yeah, and that's the way the whole world should work. Yes. <sighs> so Clarence Birdseye is is the man who developed this system of uh of removing the the consumer from Aaron just flew by i'm telling you it's today it's a... on animal planet clarence bird's eye with <laughs> gary <laughs> with gary kovar in <laughs> they were going to change my name to gary bird's eye <laughs> it would be like have you ever watched any of those slow tv things with like trains or it's just like slow travel or a fireplace it would be like that only it would just be like gary like sitting on a porch and like kind of narrating things like oh look there's a squirrel <laughs> i would I totally watch the, that i would think i would find that calming <laughs> i need to get in the habit of getting outside at like six in the morning and listening to the birds wake up again that was always an amazing thing are you good at i'm horrible at identifying birds i can do like the main ones from like that's a cardinal that's a blue jay and then beyond that I'm, oh pigeon i got yeah, I mean, I know the ones that I grew up seeing, but I mean, I, like, there's some birds I'm like, I wish I knew what that was. And I've been wondering for years, I've looked at pictures online, I'm like, ah, I don't know. I mean, it's the grayish yeah, one. <laughs> I, I know. It's gray, it's got the brown things on the back. Yeah. I know a couple, feathers. but I only know those because I only know those because Aaron knows all the birds. Yeah. You know I, don't I, don't have, I don't have any knowledge of my own. All my knowledge is just proxy of Aaron's brain. <laughs> me too. Me too. about Google. I don't know. Wait, does she know them on site or because does she know like bird songs as well? She has looked up bird songs. She, I mean, she does, she is a lot more uh, observant and knows how to look for things in nature more so than the average person. Um, so like when she hears like, what the hell is that sound? She'll like stop and like actually find the thing and then if she doesn't know what the thing is then she'll look it up and say like weird gray blue bird that makes khaki khaki sound and, mm -hmm. and like you know find it somehow online and um and then she knows and then she knows yeah she also has been using this, this app called iNaturalist where um you can take pictures of things found in nature and um and then people will just submit what they think it is or, and it has a built-in sort of identification thing where like it'll try to match up uh, the actual uh, or match up a thing with, with your picture and say, is this the thing that you took a picture of? And then you can like, so you have a catalog of all the things you've identified. And wow, if you can't identify fantastic. it, 
if you can't identify it, then people can submit their answers and you could look at their answers and say, yeah, that's the thing or no, that wasn't it. I might have to download that today yeah. and take pictures of lots of things. Crowdsourcing that seems really cool because even I know for plants, especially for like types of succulents and stuff, you can like someone will be like, oh, I think it's this type and it's at least in the same family and then that narrows it down so you can actually like figure out. What's really cool is you can see in the area that you are currently in on a map the observations that people have made in your area and they're color coded so you can see what type of observations So, like this color for animals this color for plants this color for like insects that's really cool yeah wow what's it say, yeah, say the name podcast, of it again? sponsored by iNaturalist. yeah i i naturalist yeah <laughs> clarence bird's eye was an i naturalist that's true he was uh <laughs> let's find out who or what clarence bird's eye is since we've got the timer okay so you weren't half wrong actually um I, I, yeah. I, we were I, entirely I, wrong that's that's the thing i'm not I, sure about which part though <laughs> <laughs> well I, I i'm not familiar with bird's eye foods i'd never heard or vegetables i had never that wasn't a thing that i was familiar with um but clarence bird's eye was the the guy who was given credit for pioneering the process of flash freezing in the united states um his company was bought by general foods which then broke off and made like bird's eye vegetables and all these frozen frozen foods. Basically, like he went on a um, hunting expedition in the early 1900s and observed how indigenous people froze their food to get through the winter because there was such a thing. And he basically took that idea and made it happen on a large scale in the United States. Um, Part of that story is really cool. Yeah. He's like, wow, Artwork, this is a great way to keep the idea of food. indigenous people. <laughs> Um, I was just thinking, like, the observing, like, huh. that's a great way to keep it. Indigenous in. people know things. Imagine. <laughs> um, but they're not yeah, delivering he, shareholder I mean, like, he, value. Let's do it at scale. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, and he invented a few other things, but it mostly had to do with, like, freezers, and that's the same kind of idea of things. Um, he also invented, apparently, an infrared heat lamp, which seemed, and also, like, a method for dehydrating food. So he was very much in that kind of revolutionizing for better or for worse. Speaking of dehydration, <laughs> um, we have a crap ton of tomatoes right now, like a ton. Uh, and so my son, who hates tomatoes but likes sun-dried tomatoes, Ooh. says, how can, we, how can we make the tomatoes sun-dried ourselves at home? And Aaron's like, well, Hmm, I think probably you put it in the sun <laughs> to dry, but probably you could use like a dehydrator. Mm -hmm. um, so we might be experimenting with the uh, with uh, sun dried tomatoes, except not actually sun dried. So I have that delicious. Do you, do you own a dehydrator? Um, Aaron's mom has a dehydrator and we've looked at getting our own dehydrator because we've used it before, but we just, and, and decided after using it, yeah, this is a thing that we should probably have, but we just haven't gotten one ourselves, but we have access. I, have, I used to, uh, sell some dehydrators. I have lots of opinions on. on but didn't you like well, when you traveled around and you'd have to go get produce for it for like to show off its powers, yeah. you dehydrate all sorts of like things that people wouldn't normally well, I say normally. I wouldn't think to dehydrate, I guess I should say. So you can almost always find a pineapple, regardless of time of year. It may be crazy expensive, but you can almost always find a pineapple. Um, so that's a good one. And if you can't find a pineapple, you can get a can of pineapple and dump the juice out in your hotel room the night before and um, <laughs> lay them on the counter on paper towels. And then You're really selling this. And take them to yeah, so um, lifestyle. Apples are also always like an option. Um, like dried dehydrated that, that, apples. That's, that's what we did. Yeah, that's what we did, and then we gave them. We gave them to people for uh, for stocking stuffers. The, this year, we don't the benefit have of pineapple apples. is just that you can't walk past and not smell it. You're like, ooh, that smells nice because it's you know. Yeah. But on the on the sun dried tomato front, I had like I was gonna say homemade sun dried homemade not sun dried tomatoes, <laughs> and they were delicious. So they weren't, I mean, they were just as flavorful as store-bought, but like, you could just tell. Yeah, I mean, the like, thing is, the thing, the, the reason why they keep their, the reason why they have so much flavor is because they retain all that stuff when, in, when they're dry, they don't lose it. They don't, they, what they lose is the water and the water doesn't have any flavor and the water is like 90% of a tomato. So it keeps, 
it's super concentrated tomatoey. I think the only thing that was different was kind of like the color, but I kind of attributed that to the fact that like no unnatural colors were added to like make it look I, like. Does that mean? It, is it, are you saying that it was like not very pretty looking? Yeah, it just it was just kind of like. Like if, if I saw like a plate of them on the counter and someone didn't explain to me what they were, I probably would have been like, oh, pass. Like, <laughs> like oh, potpourri, okay. <laughs> yeah, it just had a different, I don't know, just had a different tinge to it. Um, I, Rhonda and I went out uh, for our anniversary for dinner on Saturday night uh, to a uh, local seafood restaurant. And um, I don't remember, I had triple tail and the waiter described like there was a tomato sauce on top and he's like, it's really like if you could take a tomato and like melt it over top. Like, that's an interesting description. It was not inaccurate. It was like someone had melted a tomato over top of this fish. So he didn't know what I was Good. talking about. Just he needs a little this, more. The delivery wasn't quite yeah. there. Nash to the description. Yeah, it was really tasty. Uh, so at the end of the show is when we typically take uh, listener questions. We have one listener, apparently, and that listener is on the show with us. Uh, so we're going to take some questions from Allison. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess I'll go with the oldest one first. Uh, what is a song that your co-host would be surprised you know all the words to? Follow-up question, is it also your go-to karaoke song? Huh. This is the time I, to shock and wow me, people. Oh, this is just an overall disappointing episode for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would, I would probably say I do not have a go-to karaoke song because I have never done karaoke. Uh, <laughs> if I did have a go-to karaoke song, it would probably not be the song that I know all the words to that you would be shocked by. Uh, I believe. I, I don't know if Which I know all the words mm -hmm. to them now. I, I, yeah. I don't know if I know all the words to them now. If, if you asked me to sing it, I don't know if I could sing it off the top of my head, but I did know all the words to the, the Tiki Tiki Room song. Oh. Um, and the reason why I knew all the words That would be that, a good uh, karaoke song. The reason why I knew all the words to that was from uh, Lila's uh, Ariel's performance uh, a couple years ago because they were doing it to the Tiki 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 Room. Um, so she was playing it like constantly and, and you, you, yeah. hear, you hear it through. Um, I also, I think, uh, know the Gummy Bear, Gummy Bear song. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, amazing. Neither of which would be my go-to uh, karaoke song. I think that would probably, th that might be like Call Me by Blondie, but only because of uh, Veronica Mars. Oh. I, um... Or actually, no, that was one way or another, actually. Yeah, either way. Interesting. Interesting. Gary? I don't know the answer. I don't know what song I know that would be surprising. Um, what are what's a song that you know all the words to? And this is a safe space. There's not going to be any yeah. proof, or oh. <laughs> there's no no evidence. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! I have a lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Um, probably a lot of um, like whatever was on like alt radio stations in the late '90s. You know, like. So if like a Counting Crow song comes on, you're like, wow, yeah. I, oh, I know yeah, all yeah, the words yeah. to this. I have a <laughs> yeah. great fake song for you in that case. I actually found it by accident yesterday. Um, there's this guy on the internet. I'm going to get cut off totally. Uh, there's this guy <laughs> on the internet who makes like, who has made lots of parody songs and he made a parody of like 90s rock dude. This um, played right after the SoundCloud you shared, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I, all of a sudden it came on and I was just like, and I was like kind of bobbing my head and I was like, what, are, what am I even listening to at this point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so zoom that mirror, that but basketball. <laughs> yeah. Um, like a cross between the, the squirrel song and uh, grunge. Yeah. If the, if the squirrel song was grunge, it would be this song. Yeah. <laughs> Share it in the show notes. <laughs> We're Any so Pearl Jam song, I feel like you could pull off and all the lyrics too and not know a single word, right? Oh, I don't think I know any. Well, I say that. I don't know any Pearl Jam lyrics. Oh, I probably know all of 10. I probably know all of 10 right now.
thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at at binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary